Welcome everybody uh, to this uh, webinar, which is the first of three that are taking place, which I'm really proud to be associated with, with Policy Press. And thanks very much to Policy Press. Can I also offer an initial thank you in advance to the terrific members of our panel, who I'll introduce shortly, who bring a lot of experience and understanding to this session and this issue. And of course, most, of, most important of all, everyone who's taking part, because this is really about making possible some kind of exchange and discussion that's as open as possible uh, within the limits of technology. That's the problem. We've tried to make it as inclusive as possible, and I'll come on to that. But obviously, technology in these difficult times uh, can be a hindrance as well as a help for some. I want to start with a very brief introduction just by suggesting that there are historically, uh, trying not to be oversimplistic, but having to simplify, uh, at least from my experience, two essential approaches historically to that have dominated the development of practical public policy, social policy. First, the kind of liberal market-driven approach with people expected to look after themselves or pay for help as consumers, or if they can't, to turn to a basic rational, rationed safety net system. And second, the approach that I think in people's minds has been associated with the post-war UK and other welfare states, based on a sense of shared responsibility for people's welfare, uh, but essentially with one group, uh, those with more power and status, determining the nature uh, and shape of such interventions. Now, both of these overall approaches uh, have come in for heavy criticism. The one, the first condemned for its uh, sometimes harshness, cruelty and wastefulness, and the other for its prescriptive paternalistic state <laughs> nature. Both, I should say, have been roundly condemned by those on the receiving end. Now it feels, at least to me, that the prevailing market-driven model is something we're stuck with without a clear end in sight. Uh, despite the broader engagement of movements like Me Too, Black Lives Matter, the environmental movement and so on. Yet people as service users in, in all that diversity have been calling for something else, for support which they are at the heart of. But what would that uh, need to look like? Are they right? Is participation enough? What other key issues might need to be addressed? For example, inclusion, addressing diversity, equality, emancipation, sustainability. I want to suggest that social policy can't go on as things are, but how will we achieve a different, better social justice-based system where diversity is treated with equality, intersectionality is recognized uh, and respected, and sustainability of the system, people's lives, and the planet are given the priority now demanded when current politics seem so fixed in place. I personally believe that a participatory approach could be the way forward. That's really what's the focus uh, for today's discussion. And it's a practical and theoretical one. We, each of the panel members, will be speaking quite briefly because time is precious and we want to make it possible to get as wide a range of views uh, from those who've, who've uh, happily joined us as possible. And I'm, I'm going to go on to some practicalities next, if that's okay, after first uh, detailing the members of the panel. Sadly, Sarah Carr, the survivor researcher, unfortunately can't be with us today. Uh, but first of all, we've got Joseph Binoclu, I'm doing this in no particular order, who identifies as an activist scholar combining a high profile role as a patient representative and researcher in patient safety with a commitment to participatory research and co-production. Ruth Lister, who's a member of the uh, Labour Party uh, of, in the House of Lords, and has a, a, an important history of work in relation to poverty, women and citizenship. Danny Dawling, a uh, human geographer based at Oxford University, whose valued work concerns issues of housing, health, employment, education, wealth, poverty and inequality. Binny Araya, former asylum seeker, activist, director of the Other Perspective Community Interest Company. Uh, finally, Fiona Williams, Emeritus Professor of Social Policy, University of Leeds, and author of the groundbreaking book, Social Policy, A Critical Introduction. Now, the kind of practicalities. 
Um, right, please, we're really keen for people's contributions. Type your questions and comments and comments in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And we, we, Policy Press, will put them to the panelists in the second part of the session. Uh, the raised hands uh, functions on, but we will message you uh, for comments and questions. If you have any technical difficulties, please use the chat. Uh, we've got closed captions enabled on this webinar. There's a button at the bottom of your screen, uh, CC Live Transcript. Please use this to show or hide text as you prefer. Uh, just to mention that details of the panelists' books published by Policy Press at a 50% discount are available here too. Uh, and I'll say this again later, use the participation 50 at checkout. And as, as I, perhaps some have already heard, a recording of the webinar will be available after the event and we'll email you with details. So please, uh, like it's a TV show, do press the buttons. We are keen to elicit as wide uh, a, a kind of range of views, not just responses, but views and responses as possible. So I'm gonna set the ball now rolling with Fiona, uh, who's been brave enough to take on that role. I'm grateful to her. Uh, and she will be speaking as most people will for a max of six minutes. So thanks very much Fiona and over to you. Thanks very much, Peter. Thanks for organizing this uh, very important subject. Um, and um, I want to begin by uh, answering the why now question, because the seminar is called uh, Why Participatory Social Policy Now? And I think there are a lot of reasons, but two I'm going to highlight are the first is that uh, widening inequalities over the past decade have also meant that marginalized groups have become more marginalized politically, culturally, socially, and economically. And this marginalization is especially marked by intersections around race, gender, poverty, disability, and migrant status. Now, in a recent book on social policy, I've also argued that the context for this marginalization is not simply neoliberalism or welfare austerity or the pandemic, although of course these are all very important. But I'm arguing that the issues that are facing future social policy are three glo global crises in particular. The crisis of care, the devaluation and depletion of care, the climate change crisis, and also a crisis generated by the racialization of external borders and its mirror image of internal ethno-nationalism and the hostile environment and everything that accompanies that. The second why now reason is that related to these events and crises I've mentioned, they demand major transformative thinking and reimagining for welfare states. What would a sustainable welfare commons look like? <clears throat> but at the same time, that thinking needs to be grounded in the struggles, the claims, and the innovative practices of social welfare movements and activisms. Now, such practices are often referred to as prefigurative politics, where practicing in the here and now, uh, developing alternative models for doing welfare in the future and participatory social policy is precisely one of those kind of alternative models. And this was the hallmark of the new social movements in the 60s and 70s who set up women's health centers, claimants unions, disabled people's organizations, black Saturday schools and so on. But although these were different, what they held in common was challenging the multiple power relations between welfare providers and, using, and users, insisting that their knowledge, our knowledge and experiences need to be central to the design and delivery of services. Now that tradition has survived uh, against the odds. Um, and I would say that in spite of, or because of the difficult times that we now live in, these times are also more marked by a resurgence in social justice activism 
in both the larger movements like Black Lives Matter, campaigns around gender violence, Extinction Rebellion, but also reflected in smaller local cooperative and co-production ventures, migrant support groups, uh, survivors groups, and so on. And again, although many of these are focused on different identities, the idea of resistance through enacting solidarity is what's common to them. And this is why, where I think an intersectional perspective is really important for thinking through uh, the meaning of participatory uh, social policy. And I don't mean intersectionality as a theory, but as a praxis. What the practice of intersectionality can contribute to participatory social policy. Because such a, a perspective focuses on the lived experiences of those who are often more marginalized or hidden or unheard because they're positioned across identities such as black and homeless or disabled and female. So this perspective highlights attention to that, those specific differences, but at the same time, it works towards a solidarity across difference. And I think that that's really important, working out how difference needs to be recognized and respected, but what are the politics that bind us together and creating alliances across difference with a different aim, sorry, with a across difference, but with the common aim of demanding that voices be heard. Now, such an approach to uh, solidarity politics, sometimes called uh, deliberative democracy or caring democracy, pays particular attention to listening in the respecting of difference. And in her work on the politics of listening, Leah Bassel distinguishes between vertical and horizontal listening. Vertical is the demand that those in power shift from speaking to listening, and horizontal is where people aim to access others' experiences and work towards a mutual identity. And these are insights that are helpful, I think, for doing co-production research as well, which I'm not going to speak about, but others may well do. So I'm going to end now because my time is up, but I think that this what I've been talking about raises two further questions, which if people are interested, we can uh, talk about. One is the role of the state in moving towards participatory social policy. And the second is how we might differently see our mutual obligations towards each other. Um, and I have ideas on both of these, but if people are interested, we can leave them to the discussion. Thanks very much. Thanks ever so much, uh, Fiona, and really getting us off to a, I think, a clear and powerful start uh, with highlighting of the intersectionalist perspective as key as a praxis. Uh, thank you for that. Now it's over to Josephine, uh, uh, and, and, and the stage is yours, Josephine. Thank you. Thank, thank, thanks very much indeed. Um, so um, what I wanted to do today is, is, is kind of um, not, not necessarily produce anything structured as, a, as, a, as, a, as an argument or, or, or to attempt to give people the answers. What I wanted to do really is to be a little bit more messy and just kind of throw out my reflections on some of the things that I think are, are happening at this point and, and why they're important. Um, so we were asked to think about the why participate social policy now um, but for me participatory social policy has always been important um, and so I know that the spotlight has now been shone on some of these awful inequalities um, that, that we're now hearing about but of course for many of us we've been trying to highlight these awful inequalities for, for, for most of our lives and I, I certainly think that um, participatory social policy um, it, I, I found was, you know, the education for me around that was when I started some of my work in, in community work in Tower Hamlets in the 1980s. Um, and I was coming out of university, 
um, fresh faced and, 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 and only only reading books about about the issues to be kind of plunged into um, Ken Livingstone's GLC, GLC funded uh, a new voluntary sector organisations. And I, I worked in several of them um, and I really got a taste of um, un, un, understanding what some of those inequities were from a kind of more bottom up uh, perspective, uh, because um, the, the policy of the funding was being targeted at self-help groups um, so that those groups um, could set out their ideas about the issues from their own perspectives. And it was very much challenging uh, some of the uh, policies that were coming from uh, what I would call the old voluntary sector, the philanthropic voluntary sector, um, who, who were doing things which I, I would argue were more on behalf of groups, whereas the self-help community organizations organizations were run by the people directly affected by the issues um, you know black and asian groups many other minority ethnic groups i was working in a police monitoring organization and um, some of the issues that they were setting out again in the context of tower hamlets somali and bangladeshi organizations we were hearing about their perspectives which were long-standing perspectives um, highlighting some of the gross inequalities that never seem to get into the mainstream. So there is something for me about um, how we've forgotten some of the history uh, in developing our participatory policies. And I think that we need, we need to go back to understand what is actually driving um, uh, the, the, the need for participation, for participatory approaches. Um, but there is an issue about, um, you know, if not now, then, then when? Um, when, 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 when will we ever do it? So I think it, it, it is important to say that. I think the second point that I want to say is that I am quite tired of, um, of, of almost listening to the rhetoric of um, participatory approaches and why we should do it. Um, and it does sometimes really feel like um, rhetoric, you know, when you keep sort of reading about, you know, bringing together citizens and communities and patients and service users to work in partnership, um, attempting to form more equitable, you know, relationships and uh, challenging the power dynamics. Um, there's a part of me that feels that I've been listening to that forever um, and I haven't seen the changes that I would have expected to see on, on, on the ground. So there has been an awful lot of talking and I think the question for me as an activist is how do we bring the activism back in because I kind of feel like to some extent with some of the participatory approaches we've become disconnected from the roots and the drivers and the social movements um, that put these issues fairly uh, on the agenda uh, in, in terms of social policy. Um, for a long time, um, you know, we've had the evidence about why um, we need to have more participatory approaches because the system doesn't have the knowledge, um, the skills and the expertise to address uh, the inequalities that are taking place. They simply don't have it. So we've had long-standing critiques of professional expertise, and I kind of feel like that's been lost again. Um, so we have clear evidence of um, the, the, the fact that participatory approaches can uh, improve patient choice, and you know, uh, get better shared decision making, um, uh, more impactful research, and, and changes to service delivery uh, and and patient outcomes. Um, so a challenge to me also is, um, how did we end up producing participatory approaches where we we excluded equity, diversity, and inclusion? Um, I'm an activist. Um, I, I used to teach. Um, uh, in, 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 um, on, in, in, you know, in, in university about kind of service user involvement and then found myself as, as, as a harmed patient um, after, um, you know, through the death of, of my daughter, which kind of brought, brought me into um, healthcare activism um, to try and get justice. Um, and I really was quite shocked because I came from a social work background where I was used to talking about 
um, equity, diversity and inclusion to come into healthcare and to see the dominance of the medical model. So again, I guess the question for me is, how did we end up um, with, with some of these narrow mechanistic kind of linear approaches, top down approaches? Um, so we had social movement drivers, which fairly and squarely put some of these uh, challenges on the table about health inequalities only to some extent for me to feel that the movement had these movements had been co-opted uh, in the in the in the in, in the sorts of approaches that we ended up with which were which were much more narrow um, and I think that the responsibility lies with all of us to address the question of how did you know, equity, diversity and inclusion um, actually get excluded um, because I have been in endless, um, endless um, um, uh, conversations over, over the years about participatory approaches and involvement. And I have felt like I've been standing at the back of the room, particularly in the patient safety movement. I started to talk about, I'm no longer prepared to stand at the back of the bus of the patient safety movement as a black woman and a harmed patient, trying to talk about discrimination and diversity and simply uh, not being heard. So I don't think it's enough when we talk about um, developing participatory approaches to kind of point the, the finger at a, at, a, at a system or the mainstream system. I actually think we all have to take responsibility and look at ourselves in terms of how we are, we have been part of a system which has so excluded so many groups and to some extent promoted uh, a more uh, narrow demographic. And we do have to uh, accept that. Um, I've sat on many senior policy um, um, committees and I think that we've got a real challenge um, in that the people who are actually driving the policy and making the policy, both at the very top, but in all of the organizations, both in research and both in healthcare practice, um, are not diverse and they don't actually have the skills and the expertise to be able to take forward the types of participatory approaches that we want to, to see in, in practice. Um, so I think that those in positions of influence, both in participatory circles, um, but, but also within the mainstream have to be much braver um, in, in actively challenging because I wonder why I have often been the only person in the room talking about discrimination. Um, and I haven't, um, you know, I, I have felt that I haven't had people have my back um, and, and, and to, to back me up uh, with those challenges. So I think those in positions of influence, I think that they really need to actively um, use that influence to open doors to a range of excluded groups. And I, I don't think that any projects um, should be able to proceed proceed um, without an EDI assessment of who is included and who is excluded. If EDI isn't at the center of these participatory approaches, then for me, it's not a participatory approach. And so to some extent, I think um, we're in a situation where we've, we've moved from the roots of some of the more radical work that, that, that we were doing um, uh, a bottom up. And I think that most of the participatory approaches that I'm involved with in healthcare are really quite top down. And they really don't involve um, those partnerships um, with diverse communities and diverse community organizations. So for me, we got a, um, we got a challenge, some of the methods and the models uh, that we're using. Um, if we're going to talk about no decision about me without me, then we've got to have the we've got to have diverse groups leading some of the work. I don't mean just being brought in um, and being part of it. I mean supported to lead the work so that we can be in those leadership positions in our diversity. Um, and I think that um, we've got to do the work um, with building up the trust uh, because I think that. Um, there's been a lot of broken trust 
um, with communities, and I see, and I, and I think we see that uh, with with things like like vaccines, because um, you know, Black, Asian, and minority ethnic groups have not been involved in research. Well, then there's also that hesitancy with vaccines because they don't trust um, the, the the system. So there's there's a real impact where if we exclude uh, people, then we can see it rebound on the types of policies then we're trying to take forward. Um, so I think that um, we've really got to, with any new models, we've got to make sure that um, equitable and diverse and inclusive approaches are, are the centerpiece of, of new participatory approaches moving forward. So those are my reflections. Thanks ever so much, Josephine. And, and, and if you look in the chat, you'll see uh, how much support there's been for what you've highlighted, taking us from a, a, a return to recognizing the importance of the history, to challenging ourselves, the rhetoric, uh, and the co-option of, of so-called participation. Thanks a lot. Um, Benny, it's, it's your turn next, if that's okay. Uh, so over to Benny Araya, thank you. Thank you, um, good afternoon. So my name is Benny, I'm, I'm not a researcher or an academic. Um, so what I uh, wanted to discuss is the perspective from the service user end. Um, I have lived in the UK for about 20 years, um, asylum seeker background, um, went through the asylum process and refugee. What I would like to highlight in this session in terms of participation in, in social policy, I would like to give three or four key examples of the social policies that deter determinately um, create misery on people's lives. For example, one that we may not think about on our daily lives is the right to work, dignity. Asylum seekers do not have the right to work and that's a very uh, uh, detrimental for people's um, mental health. Shared accommodation. When you are over the age of 18, we feel that we have the right to be independent. There was a policy not long ago, clear social policy given by immigration to private contractors to house two adults in one room. Pretty much about, you know, uh, 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 unheard of for some people in the UK. Destitution. A social policy that clearly says, we can't return you back to your home country after 10 years, after 15 years of claiming asylum. However, we have the right to make you homeless and destitute with no means of whatsoever. And we are happy for you to roam around our streets and commit crime if you wish to. And that is another social policy. So these are some of the examples. And very sadly, very, very sadly, where I am based in Middlesbrough, one of my clients who is young Egyptian, disabled Arab asylum seeker, jumped on River Tees and committed suicide after suffering severe with mental health. This is up less than seven days ago. And I am counting the impulses into individual lives are simply not taken seriously. From where I operate, my charity, we are almost accounting one single asylum seeker in a small town, about 130,000 people or so. One asylum seeker committing suicide or serious offense because of the desperation every year. I have lived here for about 20 years. That's about 20 bodies. And it feels so unreal to see injustices taking place. So the question of now is it is actually overdue. Overdue for me by 20 years, because I have lived here for 20 years, maybe for some overdue by 50 years. So that is the term why now. Now, I wanted to also share a highlight of learning from service users or uh, you know, uh, receiving end from their experience. Experience or professors by, 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 by uh, how do they call it? 
uh, experts by experience, experts by experience. The value of that. We had a project with Peter, knows about it, which is called Mend the Gap. And that is linking with social work students to learn from unaccompanied asylum seeking children on the service that they provide. And we delivered, even universities have had difficulty to understand why they need to introduce that approach, even universities. So these are institutions that are supposed to be leading the way. They found it so difficult to put it in their curriculum so that social work students can learn from the very people that they will be due to serve in a couple of years. When that happened, so much have got, you know, so many students have got so much out of the experience, the direct experience of unaccompanied minor children. And two or three are now in a position as social workers who have gone under the training and now working with them, which is fantastic. But why is that so difficult for universities to adopt it? I, one would have assumed that they would jump into the opportunity. Now, we forget government policies on the side. What are we doing as people? Do we have enough understanding why it is so important? Politicians could say everything that they want. A very clear example is when the Ukraine, Ukraine um, crisis arose, the application form was developed. Imagine the application form takes about six hours for someone to, 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 to complete it, for someone who speaks English. However, the most funny part of it, and that is why how so much are in touch, so much, so much distant government is that they put an application form over 30 pages in English for a, for a Ukrainian uh, uh, refugee to complete. So that says something of the value of participation in social policy and where we are at today. It is despicable, it is difficult, it is demoralizing. And, and, and to make it so crucial is that no understanding the impact of it on the service user. I think I'll, I'll, I'll uh, because my previous uh, uh, speaker have taken a little bit more minutes, so I will say, I will finish mine here. Thank you. Thank you, Benny. And, and what you should be talking about, which we've come, I think, perhaps to take for granted is what I would perceive as being antisocial policy, antisocial public policy, with, with a cruelty which you, you refer to governments not knowing, and perhaps that's true that governments don't know, but the cruelty is, I think, in so many cases, uh, beyond belief, and you've actually described a very recent expression of that, somebody being driven to kill themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Binny. Uh, over now to Danny uh, for our next contribution. Thank you, Danny. Uh, thank you. Um, what I'm going to try and do is ask, what are the, what are the big things? What are the issues? Um, Sorry, I put my mic near. Is that better, Fiona? Yes, that's good. Okay, great. Uh, what are the big things? What are the issues that partly mean that these issues that we've been talking about don't get so much attention and aren't seen by many people as being that important? What, what is going on? The, the question we were given uh, for this uh, event was, what are the big social policy issues today? And what relationship does our participatory approach have to these? Now, I'm going to show you some slides in a minute, but I'm going to argue that the biggest one probably is not climate. Uh, climate's only a big issue for social policy in the same kind of way that nuclear war was in the 1950s, 60s and 70s. Nuclear war was an incredible fear in the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s, but it wasn't something that affected social policy very much. Climate does matter to some people more than others. I'm next going to argue that the biggest single issue today has 
a name that we don't know what to give to it. So we call it the cost of living crisis, the pay squeeze, we call it austerity. These are all terrible phrases for something that we can't uh, explain that easily. And I'm going to show you a few pictures because I'm more comfortable with uh, graphs, uh, but I promise I'll keep to my six minutes. So, with luck, now you can see a graph. Yeah. Um, this is a graph produced by the TUC, updated a few weeks ago. The green line is us now. And that is the pay squeeze for people in work. And it's currently predicted by the Office of Budget Responsibility to go on till 2025. But since then, inflation has risen and so on. So it may go on for longer. How bad or how big is it? Well, all the other little grey lines are half a dozen of the biggest recessions in the last 200 years, including the huge one after the 1929 crash. And this has gone on for longer and overall will be deeper by the time it finishes. Only the crisis after the Napoleonic Wars in 1798 compares. And, you know, it's only going to take another six, seven or eight years for us to actually beat that record. So it really is unusually bad. If you're sort of thinking, is it just me? No, it's not just you. And this has an effect on everything else. On, you know, it's partly why the kind of things that Fiona was talking about that happened in the 1960s and 70s all those action groups setting up to do things differently is partly why they don't happen because just getting by just managing to work out how on earth you're going to put the heat on is taking up too much of people's time and effort uh what do people say when you ask them what the most important issues are well this changes over time and it depends who you ask and it and it depends on uh when you ask them but the latest ONS survey I have is from September 2021. And when people were asked what's the most important issue then, they said the coronavirus pandemic. Secondly, the economy. You know, the economy's got worse since then. But only 10% saying climate change, 8% saying Brexit, 7% saying employment, 5% saying that issues about education, just 4% on the, on the NHS. Uh, Surprisingly, still 3% of people say immigration is the biggest issue in Britain. This is after we've imposed incredible immigration controls. Uh, then housing and then other. So I'm going to move on to the pandemic and then I'll, I will bring it to an end. And this is a complicated slide, but I want to argue that the pandemic may be as or even more important than the economic crisis that we're in because it's not going away, it's not ending. Uh, we are the only country in Europe which has a randomized survey of the population where we test people every week, every two weeks uh, to see whether they've got COVID. And this graph is showing you the proportion of people in percentage who have it by areas. After Christmas, 13, almost 14% of people in Tower Hamlets, in Hackney and Islington, in Burnley, Hindburn, which is Accrington, Pendle, Bowie, and so on. And then you can see it kind of coming down a bit after Christmas, but then the last few weeks, rates have shot up again. And currently they're highest in Bournemouth, Paul, Christchurch, Plymouth, Torbay, the coast of Suffolk. Over 10% of everybody, over one in 10 of the whole population there has COVID. These are retirement areas. These are where there's an elderly population. Um, let me uh, zoom on <laughs> to keep to my promise. And the pandemic and the austerity, I think, are going to dominate our times at the moment and squeeze everything out. This first little graph here shows you the proportion of everybody who's died with COVID since it began, uh, are making estimates for 2022 based on the first 12 weeks of the year. It might be worse, it might be better than that, but still, 15%, one in six of all men who are aged 90 and above have died with or of COVID. 10% of all women aged 90 or above. It's something that we haven't seen since at least the 1890s. Uh, the second graph is the standard government's hospital 
uh, graph which just shows you hospitalizations are going up. The pandemic is here to stay. Austerity is here to stay. Both of these things are, are some of the most important issues and they will dominate what we do. And I'm going to leave you with uh, the standard question. We have more data. I know it's not participation, but it's interesting. We have more data than ever before. During the pandemic, ONS surveyed the population every week or two weeks, asking them loads of questions about how they were. We've never done that before. We've never gone through a pandemic and asked people detailed questions. These are the least detailed that I'm putting up. You know, how worried are you about the coronavirus right now? Very, somewhat, neither, worried or unworried, somewhat unworried, not worried at all, and so on. So it's not participation, but we can actually look at how people are feeling and how it changes. And then to conclude, um, I think it's worth thinking how easily your views, my views, all our views are altered by what we're presented with. I've just shown you coronavirus levels rising in retirement areas of Britain. Um, for the last two weeks, deaths have risen, we know they're going to rise again. And that's probably influenced how worried you'll be. But of course, the main influence on your worry is what friends and family tell you, and also what media and news uh, you watch. And if the media and the news is dominated by well, war, austerity, the pandemic, a little bit of Brexit, everything else is going to be squeezed out. And I'll stop sharing at this point. And thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much for that, which must be unusual in contributions to current social policy to take us from the Napoleonic Wars, appropriately, um, to the, the scale of and, and concerns that people have based on what? I mean, you've referred to the newspapers and the mass media. What fascinates me is how few people actually buy the newspapers uh, and how things like the BBC have become an echo chamber for, for their very limited uh, and restricted and atypical voice. Um, but that is the context you're saying to us, I think, of our discussion about participation and changing it. And I think now um, I'm not sure what our situation is because we've had a difficulty with accessing um, Ruth. And I, I don't know uh, what the situation is with Ruth at the moment. Um, I wonder if Jess could just confirm with me if, if uh, she knows where we are with regard to Ruth. Uh, and, and I can only imagine that Ruth's been taken up with business in the House of Lords uh, and, and diverted her. We'll just check on that and then we can move into the question and answer uh, phase. Uh, if uh, if uh, Ruth uh, arrives late, we could um, stop the question and answer and let her okay. speak. Perhaps we should do that. Hi, Peter. It's Jess. Hi, Jess. Ruth, I don't think Ruth's going to make it. So I think oh, that's, that's a shame. I, well, I, haven't heard, I haven't heard from her, but let's, let's go to the name. Let's do what Josephine said and, and move over to the uh, questions. which I've got to find now. <laughs> Why isn't it coming up? C could I ask you, Jess, could you just set the ball rolling with the questions? Because I've looked at the question. Oh, here we are. I found them again. Sorry. Thank you. Um, somebody's asked, I think, a very pertinent question, especially in the light of what Dan has just told us. Uh, do you really think anything will change with the Tories in power? Uh, and I, 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 let's have a volunteer for that one. Is there someone who'd like to answer that? I don't think it's something I should just impose on somebody, but I do think it's an interesting question. Any takers? Josephine. And we'll, we'll, we'll try, Josephine, we'll try and have reasonably brief answers to get loads of questions and comments in, okay. Mine's just gonna be a, probably a slightly different take on this, which is that um, when I got involved in, in patient safety after my daughter died um, of medical negligence, and I, I, I've been fighting for justice for 20 years, um, Labour in power or the Conservatives in power didn't make a job of difference. The cover-up culture was the same under Labour, which I fought all the way through and was devastated by as it is under the Conservatives. So I think we've sometimes got to be a little bit nuanced 
um, in where we think the change will come from. And anybody else who'd either like to disagree or agree with Josephine uh, from the panel? Uh, I'll, I'll butt in largely to agree. I, I suppose it's a pity Ruth isn't here because, you know, as a Labour member of the House of Lords, I think she's in the other side of this. But that, that could be a good reason for not being here as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, you can tell that I look at the numbers. If I look at something like the basic measure of inequality, the Gini coefficient, the official government measure, which is released every March, uh, hasn't been reported on this March, nobody's noticed because of everything's going on. The government measure of inequality since the late 1990s has not moved in any year by more than 1%. Uh, well, there was one year, but that's random out to 20. So there, it's not just, I mean, different political parties do things and the Labour, New Labour did do certain things. Um, I, I, I try not to annoy people by downplaying it, but in no single year did they uh, reduce or increase income inequality for families at all. You can't see the change of governments um, for this long period since late 90s all the way through, through to now. Um, it doesn't mean that things won't change. It just means we've lived through an extraordinary period uh, without change. But currently, uh, you're looking at the group who most support the Conservatives, which is the elderly and better off people, being worst hit by the health crisis in terms of illness, hospitalizations and deaths. Um, you know, that's going to be interesting for the Conservative Party of what happens when your core voters are suffering what is far what is far worse than they have suffered for decades uh, before and the cost of living crisis is going to affect the middle classes um, as well so i i would be amazed if, we, if we're still in this kind of political situation in five or ten years time because it's a question of you know just how much can a population be harmed and carry on just saying oh it's okay i'll vote the same way Thanks for that, Danny. And I'm really pleased to say we have now got Ruth with us. Hiya, Ruth. Um, and if it's all right with you, uh, we hope you might have a contribution now. Is that OK? Sorry, I thought we were starting at I thought it one. No, it was 12. Sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I had to get it down at 12.45. To, I'm, I'm really sorry. To, uh, uh, we understand that. And we hope you'll understand better late than never, as far as we're concerned. It's really good you're here. I'm really, really sorry. <laughs> okay, yeah. <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm really, I'm particularly sorry because it means I haven't heard everybody else, um, which I was hoping to do. Um, and um, I'm thinking it's an odd time to have it over kind of lunch. But anyway, I've been rushing to have my lunch while I could have been here. Anyway, thank you for the invitation to take part. Um, and uh, my engagement with participatory social policy has primarily been with regard to poverty, uh, which linked to inequality and inequalities is very much a key social policy issue at present, I would argue. And it was in fact Peter uh, who uh, showed me the way, uh, having challenged me at a conference many, many years ago. Uh, and um, my belief in the importance of participatory approaches was cemented really as, as a result of being a member of the Commission on Poverty, Participation and Power, um, half of whose members had direct experience of poverty and which, as the title suggests, focused uh, very much on participation and the barriers to it. Among other things, it taught me the importance of genuine participation as opposed to consultation. Um, and also of capacity building among uh, officials and professionals, uh, as well as members of marginalized groups, such as those living in poverty. So I suggest there are both principled and instrumental arguments uh, for participatory anti-poverty social policy. The principled arguments can be derived from a human rights approach. Uh, participation has been identified as a fundamental human and citizenship right that underpins other rights. Um, and it recognizes dignity and agency and goes to the heart of the voicelessness, powerlessness, 
and dehumanization associated with poverty. In doing so, it can be transformative for how people in poverty are perceived and how they perceive themselves. And this came across, for instance, at the launch of the report of the, co the highly participatory COVID realities project. Participants talked about the importance of their voices being heard through the project. And one said, I now refuse to wear the badge of shame and stigma. And instrumental arguments include the strengthening of democracy and the improvement in policy making um, if the expertise of experience is brought to bear. And this was recognized in the Lord's uh, Economic Affairs Committee report on universal credit, which included as one of its principles that UC must reflect the lived experience of claimants. They must be at the heart of the design and involved in developing solutions to problems. A principle ignored in the DEWP, DWP's response to um, the report and in the minister's response when I uh, questioned her on it in a recent Lords debate we had on the report. And although ministers quite often pay lip service to the importance of lived experience now, there's no real evidence of it being built into the policy making and implementation process at Westminster. And when I and also the Green peer Natalie Bennett recently asked questions in the Lords about what assessments have been made of the findings <laughs> and recommendations of the COVID realities project, uh, we received the answer that no assessment has been made. Honest, but uh, disappointing. Uh, in contrast, Scotland has shown how it can be done in social security policy. And in England, through the Independent Commission on Social Security, social security claimants have developed alternative policies with the support of Michael Orton, a social policy academic. Um, and this is an example of what I think has been real progress in civil society and in the social, social policy academic community, which gives me heart. This in part um, reflects the emergence of um, overlapping coalitions of groups led by people with experience of poverty, uh, notably Apple, which is forging a relationship with the all party parliamentary group on poverty, which I co-chair, and um, po Poverty Two Solutions. And the latter organized and led the launch of a video and booklet about participation with support from Joseph Rowntree Foundation this week. And one of the long-term goals they articulated was the creation of a legal duty to embed participatory approaches in policymaking. Another important point made by a member of Poverty, Poverty Two Solutions uh, at the meeting is that while initially members had seen the knowledge based on the experience of poverty as the only legitimate form of knowledge, they come to appreciate what ATD Fourth World has called the merging of knowledge, in which the knowledge ball of experience complements rather than replaces the knowledge derived from academic study, professional practice, or activism. And of course, each form of knowledge can be associated with a range of views. And any of the uh, and one of the challenges is how to allow for that in practice. And what has been so inspiring about the merging of knowledge approach has been both a process involved, genuine, genuine listening to each other, uh, and a French academic involved in ATD, ATD research, writing in the CPAG's journal Poverty, described it as a permanent invitation to position oneself as a student in relation to the other person's knowledge. And the outcome, and, and also the outcome in terms of helping to forge new forms of what the American um, academic Alice O'Connor called poverty knowledge. So as someone who's based in Westminster, I can see how difficult it is to break down the walls that keep out marginalized groups such as people in poverty. But at the very least, I, what, what I can do as, is kind of act as a kind of ventriloquist and quote directly from e.g. COVID realities and during the passage of the pernicious Nationality and Borders Bill uh, from what asylum seekers themselves have said and written so that their voices are heard, albeit at second hand. I'll leave it at that. And again, I'm so sorry. To no, 
Ruth, thank you. And thank you so much. And I think your point about the um, equalizing the relationship between traditional so-called expert knowledge and experiential knowledge, and then the least that all of us have a responsibility for if we are not experiencing particular forms of exclusion or oppression is, as you put it, to try and access, especially from powerful places, those viewpoints. I think that that kind of chimes very closely with what people have been saying, and especially the particular instances that Binny has referred to. I, I'm, I'm, I hope you won't mind, but one of the questions, we've got through one question so far, but it's one where you'd have a particularly helpful contribution. Uh, and I wonder if I can ask, ask it of you. Uh, if you don't want to take it on, that's fine. But the, the question was, do you really think anything will change with the Tories in power? And if, if from your Westminster position, you'd like to give us a response, that would be really helpful, but don't feel obliged. Um, it's kind of very diff difficult, and I'll try and take off my party political hat because <laughs> I am in Westminster as a Labour peer. Um, and I, I heard just the end of what Danny was saying. Um, I mean, obviously, my hope is that they won't be in power for that much longer. Um, but I think that will only happen if if um, Labour is willing to work with other parties who um, you know uh, share at least some of uh, their their perspective. Um, <clears throat> Not in the short term. I mean, I think the short term, it's very depressing. I mean, the, the, the Chancellor has felt able to um, ignore the, the huge pressure, to, first of all, to um, restore the £20 uplift on universal credit, uh, and then uh, the backlash against the, the pathetic spring statement in terms of helping people in poverty on low incomes, people are, people are struggling generally. Um, and, but I do think they are, I mean, they are sort of worried. So it is possible that there will still be some action, but I mean, I, my understanding is, and this isn't based on any kind of special inside knowledge, is that despite the, the the action he took during the pandemic with the 20 quid uplift, that Sunak is absolutely opposed to so-called welfare, what I call social security. Um, and of course, you know, he is a, a self-avowed Thatcherite in terms of his ideology. Um, and there are a number of other people in the cabinet, not the prime minister, who doesn't have an ideology as far as I'm concerned, um, who share that kind of ideology, who, who think that so-called welfare creates dependency culture and so forth. And as long as that kind of view is prevalent, my worry, you know, I, I fear that any progress will be very limited. And it did look for a, a while as if public attitudes might shift as a result of the pandemic. Um, more, so many more people having to claim universal credit, so many more people understanding what insecurity really means, economic insecurity means. But my understanding is that the, the, the sort of opinion, the public attitude service suggests that that change of heart was perhaps short lived. Although there has been, I think, a longer term shift towards greater. Um, uh, public support for uh, people living on benefits for, for, for improving the social security system. So then there may be some hope there. I mean, I, I always believe there has to be hope because otherwise we all just give up and go home. Um, but the short term, at least, it's not looking very good. And, and my worry is that if there is a change at the top, which there could still be, but not perhaps immediately, that it will be the, the neo saturites who take over and then we could go backwards even further rather than things get better. But perhaps that's, a, a, you know, I mean, I, that's too pessimistic a view, I don't know. Well, thank, thanks for that. And it, it suggests to me some kind of convergence between the kinds of things that Danny was uh, evidencing uh, uh, and where you were coming from 
in a position where I think more than many people, you get you, you must have your finger on a pulse. But it does move me on to uh, another of the questions we've had um, from Peter Atkins. Is the current political system fit for purpose in 2022? Uh, and because and it, it does feel a bit like we've got a brick wall in front of us and in front of democracy. And would you mind, Fiona, if I, if I asked you that question and then perhaps come on to Josephine afterwards? Is it fit for purpose? There's a corollary to that question, of course, is if it isn't, what might we do about it? Well, certainly, as far as the ministries who are concerned with social policy, uh, Home Office, uh, uh, DWP, and so on, I mean, they are not. Uh, I mean, what comes out very clearly since um, since the beginning of this century, a little bit later, but particularly with the, the Tory governments, is the incompetence, I think, not only indifference towards uh, people and the problems they face, but a total incompetence uh, uh, of, of being able to do anything and then covering up that incompetence by lying. And I think that that sort of vicious circle that has now almost become normalized, um, and, and we, we know that that's happening on a level, you know, with Partygate and things like that, but it's happening on a level of social policy. I mean, if you look at the, the Windrush scandal, if you look at Grenfell, I mean, even now, over Grenfell, where there, um, the Minister of um, Local Government, uh, Eric Pickles, was interviewed the other day. And he said, oh, I, I didn't know, uh, you know, I, I didn't know that our housing stock was, you know, implantable. You know, that, that, that sort of, um, uh, the normalization of, of people just not admitting to what's going on. I have to say, somebody who's an optimist, I find that the most depressing thing. Um, but I, I also think that a lot of other people find that depressing. And therefore, in terms of movement, political movement, um, kind of being honest, I think, uh, it would be a great positive, rather than as I see the leadership of the Labour Party now kind of skirting issues, you know, kind of dodging bullets or, or trying to go along with, with what they think people are kind of worried about without sort of being honest about, about some of the things. Um, so uh, rambly question, uh, rambly answer. And it's interesting to see what we've had from Cara Molina who said, and don't forget the disability strategy deemed unlawful and yet not scrapped. And it's like you can get away with things, picking up on your point. Josephine, is there something you'd like to add to that, that uh, response to the question? Um, well, I like the things that uh, Fiona has just said. Um, and I mean, all I would really add to this is that um, if I thought that I was going to get the solutions that I wanted from mainstream politics, I think I would have given up a very long time ago. Um, and I, I do, do remember in, in the 90s when I think I once entertained standing as, a, as an MP and entered the Labour Party uh, for a little bit and rushed out as soon as I could um, because I, I just felt like I was caught up in the battles really when I actually want to do something. So I think that um, one of the things that I found with my work in patient safety was the cover-up culture and the cover-up cu culture hit me fairly and, fairly and squarely, both via Labour and via the Conservatives. So I think for me, my strategies have been to find different ways um, to keep having a voice and to tackle in the issues where I can. So, you know what, I'm still strong. Whereas if I had put my solutions in systems that are, are, should be working for us, and, the, and, and, and had got completely disillusioned with the lies and the deceit um, on, 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 on all sides of the political spectrum, I would have given up it, because I've kept my roots kind of in some of the smaller stuff, community stuff and more bottom up stuff. I've still got the hope that you can still do some things uh, in a participatory way for ourselves that will make some sort of difference. Thank you, Josephine. And can I come on to another question now from David Farnsworth, 
which I think really closely builds on 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 those re responses. And if you wouldn't mind, if Binny wouldn't wouldn't mind having a bash at this, where will the change come from? Um, if we could, if you don't mind, anyone can refuse any question, by the way. But uh, Binny, yeah, are there things uh, uh, yeah. Uh, 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 somehow my instinct response to that is I think it comes from education and, and uprising. So I think uh, population, so we have recently seen the, um, you know, I can only talk about immigration most of the time because that's where my um, knowledge is, but the response from government to the Ukraine, why is it that different than the uh, immigration for Afghanistan and Syria and, and, and South Sudan? Um, so I think people now started to realize that there are discrepancies, um, not that the Ukrainians have received any great support from government, but population started to realize where the gaps are and, the, and, and they are making the situations even more bolder. And, you know, we have had COVID and then the inequalities become quite significantly vivid and clear. So I think, you know, we shouldn't be waiting as population or as citizens until a big hit arrives and then we learn from that, I think we should always be cautious and aware of where the problems are and we need to start taking action at even a smaller uh, level because it is those smaller bits that would add up and then start hopefully uh, uh, be heard or be noticed. Thank, thanks, Benny. And I'm looking at another question now, which comes at it from the other end, but is raising, I think, something very important for us to think about. And if I could turn to Danny, um, one of the question the speakers posed the question, what's the role of the state in moving towards participatory social policy? What, what do people think? Is there a, a, a feasible role for the state uh, here and how could it be encouraged? Danny? Uh, I think one way to look at this is, is to look at different states. Um, so our, our problem is we tend to look at England very much and say how terrible things are. Now, we are the most unequal country in Europe and so on, but you can look at other states in Europe. The one I've written about is Finland, um, but even nearer, you can look at Scotland, which is halfway to be being a state. And you can look at the outcomes there from the involvement of the state and what it does. Uh, I'll give you just two examples. We exclude permanently many, many thousand children from schools in England every year, permanently excluded. In Scotland, they exclude five, huh. five children, right? That is the state deciding to behave differently. In Scotland, they have targeted monies towards mothers and poorer people, and their infant mortality rate has fallen below the rate in England. Um, so it's not looking at Finland and kind of like as good as it can get. This is Scotland, right? Your state can do things. And in those parts of Europe where outcomes are far better, it is the state which has been doing it, not community groups, not, not something else, it is the state. Um, elsewhere, I, I, I won't go on, but the, the state is crucially important um, in, in this. It's a state which provides your education in most places for almost everybody, just not in this weird country where a third of our spending on education is private. Um, it's the state which provides your health care and it's the state that provides up to half your housing in a normal, decent country. Um, but, you know, we, we've come to talk down the state and what it can do because we have such an awful state. You can look to the United States for one that's worse. Um, but, but it, you know, it is, it is the state, the state that does it. Charity won't, never does. Thanks, Danny. It does feel a little bit like we need to borrow somebody else's state uh, if we're talking about the situation in England. We, we, we're almost at our end now. And um, I promised a panelist that each person could have like a 30 second soundbite, but opportunity just to say any thoughts they've got about uh, ways forward. I mean, we've heard things which sound desperately disturbing in terms of it, in, intransigence, but also a, a perpetual message at the same time of things that people are doing which are real and making a bit, a bit of a difference. So could I start us off with Fiona, if you wouldn't mind, Fiona, uh, any, any quick thoughts uh, to take this discussion forward? Uh, yes, uh, I'm, I'm just going to reply to the previous question and leave that as an, an end thought. Um, 
I mean, Dan is right that it's states that do things. And, and I raise this in, in my contribution because I think that there is increasingly um, a, a lack of kind of dialogue between what are proliferating groups actually and uh, how to change what the state does, you know, to think in those terms. And, and really what a state should be doing is, apart from the infrastructural things that Danny mentioned, is enabling local initiatives, paying so that people can be involved in local initiatives, paying uh, for, for people to be involved in those sorts of voluntary activities, paying carers for the work that they do, uh, and so on. So, and that you have to have a, a strong state actually to guarantee um, people's rights. And uh, although I'm very critical of, of labor and power, um, I would say that one of the good things that they did was Sure Start, and particularly where Sure Start where people in local areas were given funding and, and then asked, how do you want to spend this? How do you want to improve that? And that was, you know, it, it's, it's laid in some, it still lies in some people's um, experiences as a good thing that happened. Um, and so, you know, those sorts of, uh, we should be pushing those sorts of things. Thank you. And what you just said about Sure Start, is the absolute truth for one of our daughters. Ruth, could I just ask you for your closing thoughts for the future? Yeah, I mean, I very much agree about the importance of the role of the state. I think, um, going back to an earlier question, we could have much more use of um, consultative assemblies to discuss difficult issues um, rather than, uh, and certainly change the voting system so that people, everyone's vote counts equally. But in terms of the state, I think, it would be really good. I don't know whether there is any evaluation going on in Scotland of what effect it is having, having the participatory approaches in their development of their social security policy. I mean, within the limits set by Westminster, but I mean, they have these um, consultative panels so they've been involving people right from the outset. And I, I think it's a really, I don't think we have to go as far as Finland. I think we need to look at what Scotland is doing and what we can learn from it. And I mentioned just briefly, but I do think it's worth thinking about this idea that was put forward by a member of poverty, or that Poverty to Solutions talked about as a long-term goal of legislating a duty to involve um, uh, people who are affected in policy making somewhere, more a participatory approach to policy making. Now, all sorts of difficulties. I don't know exactly how one would do it, but it would at least require, uh, when signing off legislation as part of the, uh, alongside sort of quality impact assessment or whatever, you could have a participatory, this you know, pro, uh, um, assessment, um, and that might force governments to talk to um, or civil servants officials to talk to those who are likely to be affected by the legislation so I think it's worth looking at I mean it's it's not an idea I'd thought of before literally only heard it this week so I, I need to think it through but I think it is a, one possible way to make the state more participatory uh, and it's a good idea thank you Danny it, it was a comment that, that Ruth made about parties working together that, that I'd like to end on. Um, the last time we had a general election, I think with a, with a pact, uh, was 1918, Karki election of 1918, and 1918 was a turning point for inequality. It fell afterwards. Um, different politicians opposed to the Conservatives that did not necessarily stand against each other then. I think as the crisis gets worse, the narcissism, middle-class narcissism of putting up a liberal candidate, a labor candidate and a green candidate in the constituency because your ideology is so terribly important to you will be seen as selfish narcissism that will prolong the suffering of others. And that I think is the most interesting immediate chance of something changing politically um, because that the shooting ourselves in the foot of wasting votes to help get a Conservative government in with 35% of the vote 
is just immensely stupid and selfish. Um, but what also I think may help this happen is the way that upper middle class lives have suddenly been made worse. Nothing compared to average people's lives, but still a hell of a shock to have faced death and suffering and now the inability to go on that foreign holiday. Okay, it might not sound like much, but in the late 1930s, when the upper middle class could no longer afford a doctor, uh, then they were not opposed to a National Health Service coming in. And I, I, I think the crisis is deep enough uh, that you could actually see a switch because the number of winners coming out at the moment in society are smaller and smaller. Um, under Mar Margaret Thatcher in the 80s, it was about 30% of the population who got by better off under Thatcher. Under this government, it's one or two percent. You know, how stupid do we have to be? Thank you, Danny. And Josephine? Um, so I think what I would say to people is be bold, be brave and hold on to your courage. Um, given my personal fight for justice over the last 20 years, which, is, which has made my politics much more personal, I've learned that my activism means that I've got to go into rooms where the policy is being made and challenge people and hold them to account. And I've found that, that, that one of the things that, um, that has happened is that where we're not in the room um, as diverse voices, with people with certain types of experiences, policy just gets made anyway, and no one really cares. And so I've told myself over and over again, you can't stand at the back of the bus. You need to get in there and try and drive that train um, and challenge people and hold people to account. And so that's where my activism is taking me. Thank you, Josephine. And finally, Benny, if I could. Really, just to build on what just Josephine had said, I think participation, for people who have been excluded or marginalized for such a long time, it almost feels it is the norm and it is the, the right way to do it. So I think there is education, but there is also perhaps um, um, uh, um, um, shouting about a policy that has worked to try and encourage people. And I think participation in this uh, presentation today um, meant something to me because I know the people who have subscribed or accessing, you know, it is a way that I could voice my concern, the people that I work with. So I think having more and more conversation is a good way of educating people so that, um, you know, policies are not just made by very few people who doesn't have a real idea the impact of those policies are. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Benny. And, and just a last sentence, what I feel after today, and I can only thank everyone, both who's asked questions, put down comments, which I hope we will keep and not lose. Uh, and I'm and, and sorry, those whose questions haven't been answered, but also the, the, the incredible range of, of, of ideas that we've had and experience from the panelists that we are having the right discussion. And it, it may not be for tomorrow. Uh, it certainly reminds us of how terrible tomorrow may be unless things change but it's going to be the right direction to be putting our effort that's one of the things i take from both what binny and josephine say that we we can waste so much of our effort doing the wrong thing and we need to work out as well as we can what is the right way to be pushing and i think we've got some further insights and i hope those will be developed during the next couple of of these sessions which i hope other people will again will want to come to uh, and then also in the agenda of policy press and don't forget you can get uh, cheaper rate books uh, by, by the people on the panel from today and also Josephine's which are available for free. Can I just thank everybody and please Ruth do not think of this as a mistake that you were a little bit late. Uh, you were there and uh, it is not the late uh, Ruth Lister we're talking about today but thanks to everybody. Uh, I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So that's it. Uh, uh, and I hope that we'll be reaching more people on the internet with uh, the results of today. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>